In this video, we're going to introduce a really powerful idea in group theory, especially in group theory's applications, and that's the idea of a group action. So this is going to be a little bit different. We're going to start with a definition. And we're going to start with a definition that's fairly formal and technical, and then we're going to recast that definition in a few different ways, including the way that we're going to use this idea most often. And hopefully in the process, the idea will seem a little bit less technical and a little bit more useful and applicable. So first, the definition. So in this video, we're going to have G be a group. So let G be a group. And for now, let's just call the operation star. I may or may not use that notation very much. And let X be a set. Not necessarily a group. Doesn't even have to have any operation on it. It may just be a plain set of objects. A group action of G on X is a function and for now I'm going to call it F, but we're going to give it a different name very shortly. F from G cross X to X having a couple of properties. Okay, so again, just in case you're unfamiliar, uh, this is probably poor choice of notation on my part. That's G cross X, and that's the set of ordered pairs G comma X, such that G belongs to G, the group, and X belongs to the set X. Okay, so now I've got now I've got three different X looking like symbols in play. I've got lowercase X, the time symbol, and capital X. I'll try and make the uh, the variable X a little bit. There we go, more like that. Now, before I go on any further and say what the two properties are, I want to invent a bit of notation here because if I use F for everything we're about to do, it's going to look awkward and it's not going to be at all apparent why these properties are natural properties to have. So the way that we're going to think about a group action is we're going to think of the idea of a group element acting on elements of X, elements of our set. And because we're thinking of it that way, it's a little bit like an operation. It's not technically a binary operation because we are operating between elements of our group and elements of this other set. And binary operations, by definition, act on two elements of the same set. But I do want to have this kind of operation-like notation for F. So, so here's the notation that we're going to create. Whenever F of G comma X is equal to Y, we write it this way instead. We say G dot X equals Y. And I'm very purposefully using the dot symbol as it's like a lower dot, it's like a period, rather than a middle dot, because middle dot is sometimes used to represent a group operation, and I don't want to get confused there. And I think if I use period, that's not going to be something I'm going to be tempted to use as, a, as an operation symbol for a group. So it's going to be G dot X equals Y. So, so sometimes we pronounce this G acts on X to produce Y. And sometimes we even say G sends X to Y, which makes G kind of, it's like, it's like we're thinking of G as a function, actually. Even though technically we haven't framed things that way, we haven't set up for G a group element to be a function. Uh, but in a way, we are going to kind of think of it that way sometimes. So anyway, that's enough introduction. Let's state what the two properties are. Okay, number one, the first property is for every element of my set, for every X belonging to the set X, the identity of G acts on X to produce X. In other words, the identity should send each element of the set X to itself. And that kind of makes, I hope that makes intuitive sense because the identity element we think of as not doing anything. So it also doesn't do anything to elements of this set X. Okay, I mean, there's no reason that has to be true. It's just part of our definition and it seems like a sensible thing to define. Okay, second of all, this one's a little bit trickier. For each X belonging to my set and G and H belonging to the group, GH acting on X will produce the same thing as G acting on the result of H acting on X. All right, so in other words, just put this in the vernacular. 
if GH acts on X, it's the same as H acting on X followed by G, which is an idea kind of reminiscent of uh, function composition. So again, there is this very function-like idea going on here. All right, uh, by the way, one thing I should mention is that a lot of people call this a left group action, and then they allow for something called a right group action as well. We probably will not use right group actions in this course. If so, we'll define them appropriately when the time comes. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a right group action. Well, just to give a little bit of background, sorry, I'm, I'm too tempted by the opportunity to say this. A right group action is constructed in kind of the same way, but instead we usually put the set element on the left and then the group element on the right. And then the rule for composition of group elements is slightly different. It's that uh, X acted on by GH is the same as X acted on by G and then all of that acted on by H. But that's not going to be how we define things here, so I'm going to X that out. So I just wanted to give the perspective that this is one way you could define a group action, and there's another way that maybe right-handed people prefer. I don't know, I'm right-handed, and I prefer left group actions all the way. I just find them to be more natural. Okay, so anyway, enough of that. These are the two properties that are needed for something to be a group action. All right, so now this is an idea badly in need of an example. So I'm going to shrink what we have here so the definition is still visible just in the corner. There we go, maybe a little bit more. And let's create an example. Now I'm just going to warn you in advance, this example is going to be kind of silly, but it also illustrates the idea pretty well, I think. So we're going to create an action in which Z acts on the set Sunday, Monday, if I write all these out, it's going to take forever. Let's just put abbreviations here. That's much better. This takes long enough, really. So the set of days of the week. And here's how Z is going to act on the set of days of the week. So for any X, uh, let's not use X because X is usually used to refer to the elements of our set. So for any G and Z, so for any integer G, and any x in our set x, which will be this set right here, g dot x is the day of the week that is g days after x. So for example, uh, so again, our group elements are integers. Remember, our group operation for Z is addition. So that's going to look a little bit different from our definition over here because I'm going to be using addition symbols throughout. Uh, G is an integer and X is a day of the week. So for example, 3.Monday is going to be the day of the week that is three days after Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then 7.Friday, I love Fridays, is going to be the day that's seven days after Friday. And because I'm an expert on Fridays, I know that the day seven days after Friday is still Friday. And zero dot Thursday is going to be the day that's zero days after Thursday. That's the same day. That's just Thursday. Okay, so let's verify that this satisfies all of the properties needed to be a group action. All right, so first of all, property one. Uh, for every X in our days of the week set, the identity acting on X produces X. Now we need to keep in mind the identity is not one in this case, it's zero. Zero dot X equals X. And that's true because the day zero days after X is X. <laughs> Man, if only everything were so easy. <laughs> so, so that is a check. We know that this, this thing that we're claiming as a group action does satisfy property one. So the other thing needed to verify that this really is a group action is to show that GH acting on X is the same as G acting on H acting on X. Uh, so let's assume G and H are integers. We need to show that. Now I need to interpret this rule correctly because our operation here is addition. So we really need to show that G plus H acting on X produces the same thing as G acting on the result of H acting on X. But I think that's going to be true because the thing on the left is G plus H days after X. And the thing on the right is G days after H days 
after x. And I think those are the same thing. So I think we can check off number two. So this means that what we have here is a group action. And it's a nice example of a group action for one reason and one reason only, which is that there's no obvious way in which the elements of x form a group. Like there's no way that I can think of that days of the week naturally form a group. So this is a case in which group elements act on some object other than group elements. All right, uh, by the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, we could also have Z mod seven acting on the same set. This time I'll just abbreviate. Okay, here's what the group action would be. It would be uh, for all, uh, and this time I'm gonna use this symbol for all in brackets, so equivalence classes in Z mod seven and X's in the set of days of the week. Again, that's the set X. N acting on X produces the day N days after X. And this time I've got to be a little bit careful because I'm using N here, but the thing that's the thing that I have in this notation here is an equivalence class or a congruence class. So I need to make sure this is well defined. Because for example, if I had brackets five here, that would be the same as brackets 12. So I would need to be sure that five days after a day of the week is the same as 12 days after a day of the week. And I guess that's not technically the same day of the calendar, but it does produce the same day of the week. So this is still perfectly fair and well-defined. And it's a group action for the same reasons, the same reasons we covered here. <clears throat> so you can also have Z mod seven acting on a set. Now, before I wrap up this video, I want to mention one property of group actions that we want to be aware of. So let's zoom out. Okay, now we're like, <laughs> we've got different levels of zoomed out here. Let's just put everything over here on the left, and then we'll write over here. Uh, let's see, how about blue for this? Nice dark blue. All right, so here's a fact, and we will prove this fact. Uh, if G acts on X, and I'm sometimes going to use this little rainbow shape symbol to mean acts on. So I'm assuming that there is a group action of G on X. So if G acts on X, then I claim this is true. Then G acting on X produces Y, if and only if G inverse acting on Y produces X. I claim this follows from the rules that we stated over here in our definition of group action. So let's see if we can prove this. Okay, so let's let G belong to our group and X and Y belong to X. And let's assume, first of all, that I know that G acting on X produces Y. All right, then I can certainly act on both sides with G inverse because I have a function that accepts elements of my set, uh, well, combinations of a group element and elements of my set. So if I have the same set element here, and I act on both of these with the same group element, I should get the same thing because my function is well-defined. So if I act on both sides with G inverse, I should get the same thing. All right, so on the right, I have G inverse dot Y. Uh, that's promising. And then on the left, I have, by the composition rule, that's the same thing as G inverse G dot X. And then, well, G inverse times G in the group is just the identity. That's the identity dot X. And by my identity rule, when the identity acts on an element, that just gives me that same element back. So that proves this direction. Now, if I want to prove the other direction, the one from G inverse dot Y equaling X to G dot X equaling Y, I can actually take the perspective that G inverse is a perfectly good group element and its inverse is G. But I'm going to prove this the more straightforward way, which is to just assume g inverse dot y <clears throat> is equal to x. And then let's act on each side with g. So g dot g inverse dot y is the same as g dot x. And then again, I get g g inverse dot y equals g dot x. And from there it follows, so I'm trying to keep everything in one frame here, from there it follows that the identity acting on y is the same as g dot x, which means y has to be g dot x. So I believe I've proven both directions of this claim here. So in addition to knowing how the identity acts, 
and how uh, compositions of group elements acts. I also know how the identity acts on set elements.